Okay, last time uh, we had this integral calculated uh, in one of the calculations. And we actually used this result to differentiate both sides twice, and that led us to show that uh, this probability distribution, this with 1 over square root of 2 pi, had variance of 1, right? Now, uh, what I didn't mention that time was that this really is the moment generating function of the uh, normal distribution, standard normal distribution, because uh, the moment generating function, which is defined as the expectation value of e to the tx, is uh, uh, you have, you're supposed to take e of anything as integral of e to the tx. So replace this capital X by small x, and then you stick in the probability density function. Okay? And then if you use the fact that these two multiplication makes the exponents add up, that's going and then you you pull this up, then you get exactly this one. So we know that the moment generating function is this. Uh, in addition, we also we also learned a few lectures ago that uh, there are uh, moments. So if you have m x t, you can write this as a Taylor series of moments. So the very first one is one. Uh, to begin with, but then you have e of x divided by 1 factorial times t plus e of x squared over 2 factorial times t squared plus e of x cubed over 3 factorial times t cubed and then plus da da da. And actually this is why we like the moment generating functions because we once we know them then we can just keep differentiating and plugging in zero to find all the values of uh, e of any x to any power, which are called the moments, okay? All right, so uh, my goal here is to show the central limit theorem. And uh, before we do that, let me just uh, remind you of this little calculation that we learned in calculus 2, which is that if you have 1 plus a over n to the nth power and if n goes to infinity, this gives you uh, e to the a. Now, why is that? Well, let's do it like this. Set a over n as t so that as n goes to infinity, t would go to 0 plus, okay? Now, another thing is that if t is a over n, then a is equal to nt, so that you have uh, n as a over t. And this is going to be important later, okay? So, now we've converted this limit as limit. Instead of n going to infinity, we have t going to 0 plus. 1 plus a over n, we decide to call it as t. And then uh, n is now replaced by a over t. And then we are going to use the following identity that anything is e to the ln of anything, because e and ln cancels, right? So we're going to apply that here to the 1 plus t. So t goes to 0 plus. Uh, e of ln of 1 plus t to the a over t. Okay, so this, this anything is now the, this entire thing. Okay, so that, that I brought it up here, and then e of ln of this. And these are the same because e and ln cancels. Then we move this a over t in front so that this looks like limit t going to 0 plus of 
a over t, oh, e to the a over t times ln of 1 plus t. And this one now can be solved by the L'Hopital's rule because if you plug in 0, it's ln of 1 is 0, so it's, this is 0 over 0 type. So if you differentiate the top, you get a over 1 plus t. Whereas if you differentiate t by t, it's just 1. It's over 1. And uh, the limit is t going to 0 plus with e of this gigantic thing. But now when you plug in 0, it's simply e of a, right? OK, so uh, I wrote this result down. Let me now start doing the calculation. So I'm going to assume that x1, x2, all of these xn's are iid, so independent and identically distributed, uh, with additional requirement that e of xi are 0 and v of xi are 1. Okay. Now, under that condition, let's define y as, uh, let's see, y as x1 plus da 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 xn divided by square root of n. And let me put a n here uh, because I want to know uh, what happens to this random variable if I add more and more xn's and, and take this kind of thing, okay? So, uh, what I want to show is that my claim is that if you take limit as n goes, n goes to infinity of yn, this will get closer and closer to uh, this z, which is a random variable that follows the standard normal distribution. OK, so how do we do that? Well, first of all, we need some properties of the moment generating function. Uh, the v of xi over square root of n is whenever something, uh, whenever you have the uh, variance, this can come out as a square. So you end up with 1 over square root of n squared variance of xi. And since this is 1, and this just squares to 1 over n, that's your vn, but uh, variance. But then, now, since v of x is equal to e of x squared minus e of x squared, uh, which is true for anything, but instead of x, if I put xi over square root of n, then because e of xi itself is 0, dividing by square root of n still gives you 0. So that just goes away. So what that means is that this is also the same as e of xi over square root of n, this thing squared. OK. And then if we take this viewpoint of the moment generating function, we see that m x i divided by square root of n t is going to be 1 plus e of x i is 0. That's our assumption, right? And then plus the next one is 1 over n divided by 2 factorial. But that 2 factorial is just 1. Uh, 2 factorial is just 2. So you have uh, 1 over n divided by 2 times t squared plus some higher order terms. But see, all the information of the moment generating function is near 0. So you can basically think of t as something very close to 0, something like 0 0.001. So what that means is that when you have a Taylor series, things after certain things become very, very small. So I'm just going to call this later thing as an error, en, which we can basically ignore. Okay? So just assume that this is a very small number. So when t is like 10 to the negative 16th power, this would be 10 to the negative 48th power. So it's like negligible at some point. Maybe. 
we're only looking at this moment generating function very close to zero. Okay? And then uh, moment generating functions has the pro following property that if you have x plus y, two random variables, if they're independent, then this is same as moment generating function of x times moment generating function of y. Well, that's, that's because th this, by definition, is e of e to the tx and e to the uh, tx plus y. But then that's same as e of e to the tx times e to the ty. And since these two are uh, independent, this splits into two. So that's why this is true. And now what we're going to do is we're going to use that fact to calculate the moment generation in function of EY. Because EY is sum of a bunch of these things, right? And therefore, this is going to be M of x1 over square root of n t times m of x2 over square root of n times t da 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 m of x n over square root of n t but all of them have the same moment generating function of course because that they're identically distributed so they're going to have the same moment generating function so this product is really the same thing to nth power so therefore, we can say this is 1 plus t squared over n, no, t squared over 2 over n, plus something very small to the nth power, because we have n of that. But now look, what is then, uh, sorry, sorry, I meant the moment generating function. So uh, what is the moment generating function as n goes to infinity? of moment generating function for yn as n goes to infinity, that's same as taking the limit of n going to infinity and we're kind of ignoring this error part we have 1 plus t squared over 2 over n to the nth power and now we apply that which is e to the t squared over 2 See, this is exactly the same as that one with a being replaced by t squared over 2, right? But wait, that is the moment generating function for z, which is the standard normal distribution. And it's another theorem that says if two random variables have exactly the same moment generating function, that means they are the same distribution. So, uh, this is the proof of the central limit theorem, which says that if you take a bunch of the same things and rescale them appropriately, then you're going to end up with a bell curve. Now, what if you don't scale? That means uh, then, uh, see, if you don't scale, then it just has wider variance. So uh, the, sh the shape won't be exactly the standard normal distribution, but what's going to happen is that eventually you're going to get uh, something uh, that's, that looks like a bell curve, okay? So, central limit theorem, if you say it really roughly, it just means that uh, sum of identically distributed independent random variables uh, ends up showing, showing the graph like a bell curve. Okay, that's central limit theorem.